Good morning, St. Andrews. Good morning. Won't you please stand across the church as we have our doxology played for us? Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
heads in prayer. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling, take my cross and follow. Follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Oh God, it is at your call that we gather. We gather because we seek to be those who will go with you all the way. We gather to be reminded that we are to be led by you, walking by faith and not by sight. Sometimes growing fearful. Sometimes growing fretful. Worrying about things that are beyond our control. So we come asking Today that you increase our faith. And we might again realize nothing is beyond your control. All power is in your hands. We pray our keep in those same hands now in the name of Jesus. But what a strange world in which we live. Perhaps it is only the times that are strange, but sometimes it's the people in the times in the world who are so strange. But it is still your word, God. And we know that as you hold us, you hold it in the hollow of your hand. We pray now for those who do not know you as do we in the free part of sin. We pray for those who will not consult you in their living. For those who give no thought to asking you to keep them safe. They're going out and they're coming in. For those, dear Master, who give more reverence to death than to life, we pray right now. Lord, bless the leadership of our country. Bless even governors like DeSantis and Abbott who would put immigrants and those seeking political asylum onto planes and fly them into places where they know not they are going. Have mercy upon those who would pursue that kind of course crime against fellow human, that, that inhumanity to humankind. Lord bless him, because we can't
can't help them. Only you can fix them. And we are glad that you are able. We know that you can do it. We pray it be done in Jesus' name. Thank you for breaking the heat wave. For turning it overnight into a cold front. What a mighty God we serve. We pray, Lord, that you just continue to strengthen us. That you might walk where you would lead. And trust you to get us where you would have us to be. We give you now, God, all glory and praise and thank you. One more time, we gather to say thank you. Being the God of our salvation, even the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To you now, God, be all glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and forever. May the redeemed of the Lord say, Amen. 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 Now that there is any resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If any man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. There were, therefore, seven brethren, and the first took a wife and died without children, and the second took her to wife, and he died childless, and the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. 
Then certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. And after that, they durst not ask him any question at all. Verses 27 through 40. As found in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. So ends the reading of our scripture. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. We now ask our musicians to please favor us with two selections as we prepare for today's message.
in the Gospel of Luke, the 20th chapter. We find these words recorded in the 38th verse. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living. For all live unto him. Our topic for your hearing this morning, what God do we serve? What God do we serve? For well, he is not a God of the dead, but of the living. For all live unto him. This is the answer of Jesus to a riddle that was posed to him by the Sadducees. The Sadducees were one of the ruling classes of that time. They were a more conservative body. We are probably more familiar with the Pharisees. They were the more liberal body. To put that into a context, making it more understandable, think of the Pharisees as Democrats and the Sadducees as Republicans. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees believed in possibility, life everlasting. Not so the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection and they took every occasion afforded them to make any such belief sound ridiculous. The Sadducees harbored only one hope for immortality, and that was through human procreation. This was their understanding. It became the basis, the assumption behind the ridiculous riddle that they put to Jesus. A riddle that was designed to make the resurrection seem ridiculous. Luke records then that to have some fun at the expense of Jesus, the Sadducees put to him the following ridiculous riddle. Master, you know. Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother died and he has a wife and he dies without children, then his brother should take his brother's widow, make her his wife, and raise up children to honor his dead brother. All right, now, Jesus, there were seven brothers. The first one took a wife, and he died, leaving no children. So the second brother took her as his wife. He also died without children. And the third, and the fourth, and so forth until all seven married the same woman and all seven died without children. Well, and last of all, the woman died too. So now Jesus, in the resurrection, whose wife is she? Because she had seven husbands. You know what we call a story like that today? I don't know what you call it, but I call it an episode of Dateline. 
You got a woman who had seven husbands, all of them died. <laughs> was anybody checking what she was giving them to eat? Maybe what maybe what, what she was putting in, in, in that drink. And now you want to add a real dateline twist? All seven of them were brothers. Which means they had to be doubles. Surely by the time you got to number four, number five, should have had a clue about what was going on. Anyway, that, that's the riddle that they put to Jesus. It gives rise to the answer that Jesus gave them. God is not a God of the dead. Ours is a God of the living. For all live unto him. Now, the question raised in our topic this morning, what God do we serve? Begs an answer to the question, do we serve a God of the living? Or do we serve a God of the dead? You know, Surely, we'd all be quick to answer, we serve a God of the living, and make this sound like a foolish question. But I'm going to tell you this morning why it isn't. There are many people who are more concerned with the hereafter than there are concerned with the here and now. Queen Elizabeth II, God rest her soul, just passed away. Her state funeral will not be until tomorrow, Monday, the 19th. Do you know there was a line four miles long with people waiting on average between 14 and 20 hours? Standing in line just to process past her body. There are many more people concerned with the hereafter than with the here and now. But we ought to consider if there has been no relationship with God in the here and now, well, there certainly won't be one with God in the hereafter. Let me put that another way. If God is not in our God of our living, can we expect him to be our God when we are dead? Given how most treat their relationship with God, it ought to be enough to make us wonder, do we serve a God of the living or a God of the dead? Now I believe Queen Elizabeth II alone. I don't have to go across the pond to make a point. I can make the point right here in the good old United States of America. The pandemic has wreaked havoc on Sunday morning worship. Turning people away from in-presence gatherings to virtual experience. Even as there is not so much an end as there is a waxing and waning of the pandemic, people are still averse to returning to worship in presence. Yes. Somebody say amen. amen. But the pandemic revealed something strange. 
attendance in worship may have plummeted, but you know what the pandemic did nothing to stem the attendance of? A good old funeral. Now I will go back across the pond and say that not only was Queen Elizabeth II popular in her monarchy, but so popular was she until they expect that church to be so packed that they have to give invitations. Yeah. And if you don't have an invitation, you can't get to the funeral. Yeah. Truth be told, we had some funerals around here where you practically needed an invitation to get in because the church, the funeral home, whatever it was, was packed. The question in a preacher's mind has always been, why, if we serve a God of the living, are there always more people in attendance at a funeral than there are in worship on a Sunday morning? The question becomes relevant. Do we serve a God of the living or a God of the dead? If we serve a God of the living, as we profess. Why are there so many who in their living profess no relationship with God while they are living? They're only concerned about having a proper funeral when they're dead. It's fascinating to me. But then people are strange. I've heard folk pray and close a prayer by saying, Lord, we just want to go home to be with you where every day shall be Sunday and the Sabbath shall have no rest. And I've been fascinated because these are the same folk who couldn't bother to come to church two consecutive Sundays in a row and yet they profess to want to go somewhere where every day is going to be Sunday. And if we serve a God of the living as we profess we do, why do we come into his courts not with praise and thanksgiving as he requires, but why do we come in looking like we had to be dragged in and then acting like we're dead when we get in? In 47 years, I cannot count the number of times I've heard folk move through what is our real call to worship. And at the conclusion, I want to say, really? I mean, the number of times I've stood in the pulpit and said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates over Jerusalem, only to hear folk try tone in monotone response, well, it ain't like us, it ain't like us. Yeah. I'd rather be a drug than a house than a drug than a drug than a drug. What in the world is that saying to the God that we serve? If we serve a God of the living, why do we come before his presence as if we are dead? So the Sadducees, a couple of millennia ago, owes this riddle to Jesus. And Jesus gave them the answer. Mm -hmm. Jesus had the answer because Jesus yeah. is the answer. Uh, okay. And the answer of Jesus lets us know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we serve a God of the living. Yeah. Jesus lets us know that there is no relationship possible with a God of the dead. Jesus tells the Sadducees, well, you know, your problem is you're stupid. In the resurrection, there is no marrying, remarrying. In the resurrection, there are only those raised up to the Lord. Jesus tells them, you know, you, you would know this if you gave as much attention to 
to all the words of Moses as to give to these. Jesus then recalls the words of Moses to counter the law of Moses. I guess then and now there will always be those who will give more credence to the dead law than they will to the living Lord. Anyway, Jesus recalled for them Moses at the site of the burning bush. He says there, Moses addressed the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. There Jesus said, God affirmed that he had established an eternal covenant with these guys and all their descendants a covenant that even death could not settle. This covenant relationship in fact continued. It continued even in death. It continued beyond death because those who die in the Lord do not die. The God of the living takes them again unto himself. They go from living to living forever. Jesus tells them what we should know. Our God cannot be a God of the dead because death is the enemy of God. To the church in Corinth, the Apostle Paul would declare that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 15th chapter, first correspondence, 26th verse. That St. Paul went on to affirm to a church at Rome. The 8th chapter of that letter. That even this enemy, death, cannot separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's 8th chapter, 38th verse, letter to the Romans. These words of Jesus today then serve to remind us that our God has no desire to be the God of dead folk. Our God has no desire to be the God of dusty old bones, spooky mausoleums, faded memories, or dead worship services. Oh. <laughs> Ours is a God of the living, not of the dead. In him, the word declares, we live and move and find the fullness of our being. In him, the word declares that we find not death, but life. And that abundantly. Now, if he has not been our God in life, we can't expect him to be our God in death. And while our God is not a God of the dead, our God is a God who is there for the dead. For we will all come down to that place when they transition from life into what we hope is into life everlasting. But there's a place we got to walk through, a, a narrow door we got to go through, and that door is called death. And the only way the God of life can get us from this side to the everlasting life on the other side is through that door. But he can't get us there if we have not been with him here. 
That was a long sentence. Let me say it a short way. Those who would live with God one day must live with God this day. And if we haven't started, clock is running. Time to start. We need to make the living God the God of our living today. Would you stand across the church? What God do we serve? There were so many ways. Maybe some still to be explored that I can take that title back and that question. What God do we serve? Some folk think they serve a God who's a vendor. Or a vending machine. You know how a vending machine works. You see what you want. You put your money in. I'll go old school. You pull the plunger. And you hope what you want falls out. A whole lot of folks see God like that. Like God is some cosmic vending machine. I may not have a lamp, but I'm going to grab a Bible and I'm going to rub on it and make a wish. It should be then no surprise that there are still folk who treat a living God as if he is only a God of the dead. Jesus, the Christ. The only one who is the way to the Father. We can't follow anything dead if we're trying to get to life. If you're trying to get to life, you better follow something dead. That is why I'm glad we serve a living Savior. someone under the sound of my voice today who needs to get on track who needs to be able to answer in their own heart of heart I know God I serve him in whom I have believed Finisher of my faith. The only one for whom I can attain the life that is promised after this life. If you don't know that God for yourself, if you have not experienced him, the person of his son Jesus, I invite you to come. that we serve a God of the living. For Paul declared that the, the word of faith is not in It's in your mouth. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you shall be saved.
start living for the God of the living and one day he'll let you live with him. Well, there may be someone looking for a church home. If you do not have a church home, and you are here today, my question to you is why? What you here for? Did you just stop by to make sure the message hasn't changed? It hasn't. Jesus is still Lord. He died for your sins. One day he's coming back. That's the message. No. We believe that if you do not have a church home, but you are here today, this is supposed to be your church home. So we invite you to come. I'll put my mask back on. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, meet me right down there at the altar. But you have to come. Remind everyone as we would prepare to leave that on Friday at 11 o'clock, that's Friday the 23rd of September, 11 a.m., at the Common Ground Church on Arroyo Vista Drive here in Sacramento, there will be the homegoing services for Essence and Chango. And we encourage you to keep our family, the Daniels family, lifted up in prayer as they go through it. I want to remind you, that not this week, not next week, but the week after, we will be in the 152nd session of California conference. The session meets in Oakland. The Oakland Hilton Airport and Parks Chapel Avenue Church on the closing day, which I think is Sunday the 2nd of October. And so we ask you to, if you haven't been praying, it's a fine time to start. Start praying for the annual conference. And for all of the preachers, they go to the annual conference because there has never been a pastor going to the annual conference. I want you to know that. Ain't never been one. Never. Preachers go to the annual conference. Preachers go hoping to be pastors after the annual conference. It's a subtlety that gets lost on folk. It amuses me to hear them stand at the annual conference floor and declare themselves to be Reverend so and so, pastor of so and so church. No, you're Reverend so and so, and you used to be the pastor. You may desire becoming again the pastor. As I have been in St. Andrews now, not seven years. But I've been here seven times. Each time being a one year duration. That's how the annual conference works. As I say to among my friends, we go to the annual conference and there we are appointed, reappointed, or disappointed. Okay. All right, so pick the annual conference. I want to thank you for your care given the church and her ministry. Care exemplified in your giving. That is to you that I can see, to those online following us who I cannot. I thank you. I do not say a lot about giving. Nowhere near as much 
as I should. Read the New Testament. You know Jesus talked more about giving than he talked about salvation. Ah, I see. Don't believe me. Google it. Google it. The Savior had more to say about giving than he had to say about salvation. And I look at it this way. Our giving reflects our relationship with God. How we love the Lord. So, how do we love the Lord? It's reflected in our giving. I had some house plants. I love to death. I guess I must have loved them to death because I forgot to water them and they died. <laughs> what state is our relationship with God? So we must not only be liberal in our giving, but I, you know, I'm going to start preaching time. Our book of law, the discipline says that at least once every quarter, I'm supposed to preach a sermon on time. Did you know that? Of course you did. But it, it's in there. It is in there. Anyway, I want you to please remember the church on your way out with your offering. And we thank you for it. It's getting better. We are not there. But it is getting better. So keep praying. Until then, keep doing like you're doing right now. Three simple things. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Watch your distance. You ought to watch your distance anyway. What business do you have rolling up on folks you don't know? But there's a word for that in the civil law. It's called harassment. Okay? We'll leave that alone. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Watch your distance. Stay faithful. I hope to see you again next week. I want you to stand across the church for our doxology and benediction. Praise God. And move all blessings for